Hello, welcome, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Serene, and today is going to be our inaugural constructive argument um, with Jeff Marlowe. And the title is just there. It says um, senior executives must give up their decision rights. Now you have no idea what is a constructive argument. It's like this. Um, I kind of find that social media is more or less an echo chamber and it's polarizing people. So I hope to bring back healthy arguments where you're attacking the argument and not the person and where people can hear different views and come to a, their own conclusion. So today I am really excited for my inaugural one to be getting Jeff. Um, and who is Jeff? So Jeff is the executive director at Align um, Agility. He spent 35 years basically telling organizations Europe and Asia and USA that senior executives must give up their decision rights. So this, um, I'm really pleased to be having him here with me. And Jeff, would you like to introduce yourself a little bit? Well, yeah, thank you, Serene. Thank you for inviting me on and uh, really looking forward to our conversation today. Um, I, it's probably not entirely true that I've spent 35 years just telling executives that they've got to give up their decision rights. But I have spent 35 years working with organizations throughout those uh, continents that you mentioned, um, really helping organizations create cultures of innovation. That's what we used to talk about. Then it got commoditized, so nobody believes in innovation anymore. So then we talked about uh, organizational agility, but then certain big consulting firms um, cut and copy and pasted the uh, software um, agile frameworks, which don't work at scale in organizations, but hey, if they can sell it, they don't care. Um, and so we can't talk about agility anymore. And so what I talk about these days is how to create a culture that is fit for a future where we have increasing uncertainty and unpredictability. So that's really the framing for today's conversation. And um, yeah, we'll get into why I think they need to give up their decision rights as we go along. Okay, so that's great. Thank you so much. Um, and we started this on Monday uh, with J uh, Jeff's article talking about you know senior executives and so forth. And then, then you know, we came up with on Tuesday and Wednesday you know, stuff from HBR, literally talking about you know the opposite. So you know, leaders have to be visionary. Leaders have to set the tone. Have to lead their organizations. Otherwise, why have leaders? Mm. Right. Good so question. all of you, I think um, a lot of you are listening in from LinkedIn and from YouTube, from Facebook. I think a lot of you have you know, raised your views and so forth. So come on, you know, give us your objections and you know, let us hear it. And so, Jeff, let me put it this way. Right? We've talked about so many of these things. Let's just discuss just the one thing, right? I mean, if leadership is not going to bother to set the vision, the strategy, the direction of the organization, what else are they going to do? I mean, what are they for if not for that? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's a question that a lot of people ask because for probably 100 years, that's really been what people have thought leadership was. You know, management was how do you put the organization together and how do you make sure it's efficient and all of that stuff. But leadership is really about where is the organization going in the future and, and how do you get there? Um, and so historically, that has been the attitude is, well, you know, leaders set the vision and they uh, uh, en engage the, um, the community of change and they remove the naysayers and they do all this magical stuff uh, because they're gifted from some sort of divine source with the ability to predict the future and therefore able to shepherd the organization to the promised land. Um, that was kind of never really true but organizations could get away with it. And what has happened, of course, in the last 25 to 30 years particularly, is technology has accelerated the pace of life. It's accelerated the pace of organizations. It's enabled us to do something like this live stream today. And um, as a consequence of that, the, the, the speed with which organizations need to move means that the time it takes for them to sense what's going on in the world, make decisions about what to do about it, turn those into plans, roll those plans out down the organization. By the time that's happened, the world's moved on. So it's not that organizations can run out and loop, that they don't need control. Of course they need control. Control requires feedback, feedback requires sense making. The big change is it has to happen so quickly now with so much agility and so much innovation at the core that there's no longer the time 
for senior executives to sit and pontificate and get consulting firms in to advise them on their strategy and roll that out into the organization and everybody follows that for the next 18 months. Any organization that was doing that in January 2020 was extremely shocked by March 2020 when COVID came along and all their assumptions about being able to travel, go to meetings, um, meet colleagues, be in the office, blown out of the water. Organizations that were already built on an adaptive future fit culture responded as they do. The ones that didn't threw their arms up, started flapping and running around in small circles. So that is really the issue that we face. And okay, COVID was a really big rock in the pond, but the world is inherently getting more uncertain and unpredictable. And that is why organizations need to change the way they operate at a fundamental level. Okay. I mean, I have two, uh, I guess, two objections to that. So the first is, if we think about all the big, like the biggest organizations out there, right? Apple, yeah. um, you know, Amazon, uh, what else do we have? Facebook. They're all, they're all pretty much set up by visionary leaders, right? Even Microsoft. I mean, we can all name the guys who set it up, yeah. you know, like yeah. this. And so, I mean, it seems as though it's been working, right? You said it's been working. They've been doing this for 100 years. Well, it's work. It works. Why change something that obviously works because if not how are they going to get that big yeah well i mean let, let's take an example of one of the organizations you mentioned and it's the organization that i guess everybody used to love to hate and maybe we hate them a little bit less now and that's microsoft right so uh, when microsoft set up what they did was they were very uh, clever the way um, bill gates managed to get ibm to adopt microsoft's um, disk operating system in order to power the PC, which was, you know, that was a big paradigm shift because IBM, the, the story always used to be nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. So the idea was if your organization needed a computer, you definitely bought it from IBM because even if it wasn't necessarily the fastest or the best or the most leading edge, you wouldn't get fired for having bought from IBM. Um, similarly, people say that these days about high buying from big consulting firms, but that's a different topic for a different, for a different day. If you look at Microsoft, right? In the, um, I forget how many years it was that Steve Ballmer was at the CEO, at CEO of Microsoft up until 2014 when Satya Nadella took over. Um, under Steve Ballmer's leadership, which was very much the traditional vision, command and control, top down, um, Microsoft's market capitalization, their actual value in terms of stockholder capital, reduced by 360, sorry, reduced by 36% uh, in the last few years of his tenure. The one good thing I would say that Steve Ballmer did was he championed his replacement as Satya Nadella. When Satya Nadella came in, the first thing he said is, we are gonna change from being the know-it-all company to the learn-it-all company. Where are they today? Today, their stock value is 600% higher than when he took over in 2014. Why? Because he went away from telling everybody what to do and started to create a culture of innovation, started to relax things, started to take off some of the rigidity where it was all around Windows, open up their um, Azure platform for work on the cloud, start to make um, Microsoft apps available on competing platforms like the iPhone. So, and you know, that is you're telling me that that's not a decision from the top. I mean, what you're no, telling me is exactly that when they change the leader, they change the ideas. And, you know, that is yeah. that is something they, from the top. But they change the culture. That's the point. The point is, it's the job of senior leadership to shepherd in a future fit culture. That is exactly what Satya Nadella has done. It's not the job of Satya Nadella to make all the decisions in the organization. He has had to create a culture of learning. As he said, learn it all, not know it all. Problem with know it all is you think you know it all, you make all the decisions, you have a rigid organization, the world changes and you die. That is what is at stake. And, and, and you know, senior executives don't wanna give up their decision rights because for a hundred years or more, we have assumed that if you say somebody's a senior executive, that is synonymous with decision maker. That the words are interchangeable. Who are the decision makers of the senior executives? We don't even engage our brains to think about, does that model work anymore? And it doesn't. That is the problem that we have to face. But the thing is that, um, you know, the senior decision, okay, so Warren has come up with a very good uh, you know, argument saying that, well, it's the leadership who made the decision to change the culture. Somebody has to make that decision, right? I mean, yeah. you know, yeah. there's, there's just no way that uh, organizational change is going to happen without anyone making a decision. Which, which is why, very carefully, today's title is Senior Executives Must Give Up Their Decision Rights. 
because it's this idea that the more senior you get, the bigger the decision rights that you have. It's absolutely true that the more senior you get, the more responsibility you carry, as always, for the success of the organization long term. But the big difference is you will not achieve success of the organization long term if you continue to hog the decision rights. You will only ensure the success of the organization long term if you build the kind of culture that Nadella has at Microsoft that has always existed in most of the tech companies because what do they do? They don't come up with a strategy and say, we're gonna do X. What they do is they invest in lots of small companies. They buy startups. You know, you look at Facebook, um, you know, Instagram, uh, WhatsApp, they've bought them. They bought them because they've seen that they are able to deliver in the marketplace. So those are organizations that have grown up by testing things out. They put something out of the marketplace, they split test, you know, you and I go onto Google, we do the same search term, we get different results. Why? Because they're experimenting on us. They are using us to help them do better sense making, decision making and action taking. And they're doing it much more tightly coupled, much more frequently, and much more embedded in their organization. And they're using that to guide the future strategy. They're not coming up with a 10 year plan for all of the things that they're going to launch over the next 10 years. That's what organizations used to do 20 years ago. They do not do it now, or if they do, they die very quickly. Yeah, but I mean, Warren has made this point, and actually I think this point was also made a couple of days ago about responsibility. Can you fulfill the responsibility if you're giving up your decision rights? I mean, you know, what? who's accountable at the end of it? Whose responsibility is it? So when you say, can you fill your responsibility by giving up your decision rights, your, your responsibility as a senior executive is to ensure that your organization is successful long term. That is why they pay you the big bucks, right? Your, your responsibility is not to make the decisions. Your responsibility is to make sure that good decisions get made and implemented. And so often in organizations, what happens? People at the top make decisions that are not very good because they're not in touch with sense making in the, in the body of the organization. Most of this good sense making happens in the body of the organization. That's where the people are who are working on creating the value. They know what's working and what's not working. They're the people who are in touch with the customers. They know what the customer trends are. They're the people who are usually from younger generations who are much more in tune with society's shif shifting changes and how values are changing in society. That's where the sense making happens. That very rarely makes it to the top at the ethereal levels of the ivory tower of the of the boardroom with the you know on the twenty seventh floor with all of the chrome and the the corner offices overlooking the city and, and the beach and what have you. And as a consequence of that, what happens is the decisions that get made are made on poor sense making. And then that once those decisions are made and work their way eventually down to the body of the organisation, people look at those decisions and they go. They can't mean that, that's bonkers. What they must have meant is this. And so people in the body of the organization save the senior executives from the bad decisions that they invariably make. Now, one of the big challenges that's happened with the COVID pandemic and working from home is people have not been bumping into each other into the corridor to say, you heard about that strategy decision from the vice president of marketing. Well, what do you think about that? It doesn't make much sense to me because we've got these customers here. And if we do that with these customers here, that just won't work, will it? And, and normally what would happen is people would have those conversations, work out amongst themselves how to correct for the ridiculous decisions that have been made at the top. But all of that is stuff that goes on in every organization. Any organization you go into, you will see that happening. But the senior executives are blind to it. Why? Because they, they, they breathe their own exhaust. They, they drink their own bathwater. They believe that they're making excellent decisions because their organization continues to perform. Their organization invariably continues to, to perform despite the decisions that they're making, not because of the decisions that they're making. And that's very <laughs> difficult. Okay, very I, difficult. I like it. But, that's a very um, difficult um, lesson for them to hear. Yes, no, but I was going to say, Tiffany says, I think the same thing. It says it boils down to the Western need, right? Like people talking to people and getting together and figuring out like, okay, how are we going to get this to work? Because the senior executives have made this ridiculous decision. And I think Warren is talking about, you know, is this really about how decisions are being made, not who makes them? Like, it doesn't really matter whether it's the people at the top, people at the bottom, but really like, you know, is it being made in a sensible way? I well, mean, what? Yeah, I mean, theoretically, yes, but in practice, when you look at how can you make good decisions in an organization, and particularly remembering you've got to make a lot of decisions very quickly and you might have to revisit them because you discover when you try and take something into the marketplace that actually the world wasn't quite the way you thought it was, so you've got to iterate quickly. So you've got to use some of the action taking to do better sense making so that you can do better decision making. So this is kind of a, a key point. 
But in theory, yes, it doesn't really matter where. You know, you could have somebody with a gargantuan brain the size of a planet at the top of the organization. And if you had enough fiber optics plugged into everybody in the organization, beaming up to this one for the supreme commander of the universe, yes, they could do it. I mean, if you watch Star Trek, that's, that's how the Borg operate, right? If you watch Star Trek, that's how the Borg operate. Now, you know, human beings don't work like that. So you have he to- died, get... I mean, Steve died last year, I think. <laughs> we had him. <laughs> you, you, you have to get the sense making really close to the decision making and the action taking based on that so that people can learn, oh, that wasn't a very good decision, was it? How could we make it better next time? If all of these things are decoupled, and so the senior executives do the decision making, ignore the actual sense making that's going on in the organization, you make bad decisions. Not only that, the people in the organization themselves are thoroughly demotivated. And why is it that year after year, Gallup do their poll, right? And, and Gallup's poll says 14% of people are engaged at work. Well, duh, you know, you take away their autonomy, you take away their competence, you take away their relatedness. The three things that the most solid research on motivation over the last 30 years have proven to be absolutely essential to people. And you go, well, we'll take those away by the senior executives making all the decisions, creating these crazy rules, measuring people to death, and then wonder why we don't have any motivation. But I know what we'll do is we'll, is we'll do another survey to find out why our people are not engaged. And oh, we don't like the score we've got this time. So let's bring in a different agency to do a different metric because maybe we'll score better on that metric. I mean, it is absolutely brain dead, but organizations do it all the time. Yeah, but I guess the whole, there's two things, right? One is in larger organizations, um, when you talk about like all like make decision and make sense of it and so on, A, it postulates that actually people can make sense of it, right? One of the things that's happened with COVID is nobody has any idea what's going on. Nobody can make sense of it. And the thing about being in uncertainty is for most people in uncertainty, they prefer more authoritarian, you know, leadership like literally tell me what to do next and the people are turning to leadership to go like okay it's chaotic change is fast tell us what we need to do next you know so when you say people are disengaged um, i actually think people need directions in more faster change and i don't think that's something that people don't want i, I at least i know i want it and i see this in my clients mm, yeah well you have interesting clients is all i can say because the reality is if people in an organization cannot see why they're doing what they're doing, if they're just being told to do it by some schmuck at the top and they go, well, that doesn't make any sense, but my boss has told me to do it. So what the hell? I mean, I better do it because that's how I get my salary. No, 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 no. I mean, I don't mean that. So um, if, let's say, okay, if things are good and things are great, I don't want to be told what to do. I actually want to like take a, take, you know, if I know what I'm doing, I want, I don't, like want you to get out of my hand, let me get on with it. But in times of great change, it's actually what you're saying, right? That things are moving so fast that people on the top can't make the decisions anymore. And mm. But it's exactly in those times of chaos and change that people become uncertain and then they look to leadership or they look to the top to say, you know, yeah. give us more certainty, tell us where we are going, give us an idea. Of course, of course. And the worst thing that those senior people can do is to say, do this, because then they're just creating, perpetuating the dependency of people on their decision making and they perpetuate the kind of illusion that somehow you know somebody gets promoted to senior management and maybe because their their office is nearer the top of the building somehow they're closer to god you know and that they'll they'll pick up god's wisdom or something because they're in a more elevated position it's ridiculous i mean you know the people at the top the further they get away from the body of the organization the less clue they've got of what's going on in the body of the organization, which is why they absolutely have to create the kind of culture that enables people in the body of the organization to do the sense-making, decision-making, and action-taking. And people will say, oh, that's fine for startups. You know, Microsoft has just achieved $2 trillion market capitalization. As I said before, 600% increase in the last seven years since Satya Nadella started to embed learning as the basic way they were moving forward. And that learning means people making sense of things, making decisions and taking action. Well, I mean, Warren was saying, is it giving up all the decision rights? Is it like kind of, we make some of the decisions, you make some of the decisions, but hasn't that always been the case? I mean, you know, leadership cannot possibly be making every decision in the organization, especially with large ones. And also they, yeah. they make certain grand plan decision and the rest of the decision operational and so on is made later. So, yeah. I mean, what is then the difference, right? If it's just giving up some decision rights. 
Uh, it's not giving up some decision rights. It's giving up the framing that their job is to make decisions. Their job is not to make decisions. Their job is to increase the capacity of the organization to continuously make sense, make decisions, and take actions. It's a fundamental shift in thinking about how organizations operate. Organizations have been designed for 100 years as though they're machines. People have been treated as though they're cogs that fit into the machine. That's why you have job specifications. That's why you have the idea that this is your job to do this thing here. And if you don't do it very well, we might try and tune you up a bit with a bit of training maybe. But if you don't do it for very long, we'll just take you out and we'll plug another person in who fits exactly the same slot, exactly the same gap in the machine. That has been the underlying philosophy of organizations. That's even why you actually have HR functions in organizations because people aren't cogs that fit in machines. They're, they're kind of messy and they have other aspects to them it's called being human and as a consequence of that you needed somebody to mess to mop up that mess that's why HR came into being you know if you actually have people in the body of the organization who are effective as leaders there's a wonderful book actually I recommend it to anybody it's called turn the ship around it's the story of David Marquet who became the uh, captain of the USS Santa Fe a nuclear attack submarine uh, it was a completely different type of submarine to the one that he was used to commanding and he previously commanded it in a very top-down way. So the U.S. Navy, after all, I mean, can you imagine any, any more top-down uh, model than the U.S. Navy? Uh, so he gets the USS Santa Fe, which is, which is a different um, class of submarine. And he's on the bridge, and they're doing some exercises, and it's a nuclear-powered submarine. So one of the things that you always do if you're the captain of a nuclear-powered sub is you get the people to crash the reactor because when you crash the reactor, it shuts down. That means you've got to switch to battery power. This is a massive, great submarine being pushed through the sea. And so you need a lot of power to make that happen. So it uses up a lot of battery power. So in order to make this a really challenging exercise, he turns to his first officer and he says, um, please go to the second speed on battery power, please. And the, and the first officer turns to the helmsman and passes on the order. And the helmsman looks really embarrassed. And, and Marquet sees this happening. And he says to the helmsman, is there a problem? And he says, yes, sir. On this class of submarine, there is no second speed. We only have one speed on the battery. So he turns to the first officer and he says, did you know this? And of course, the first officer says, yes. He says, well, why did you pass on the order? And he says, well, Captain, you gave the order. And Marquet thinks, oh, my God, we're all going to die. And so what does he do, right? What he does is he doesn't go on a crash course to learn how to run the ship himself. What he does is he changes the way people operate in the organization. And so if you see the subtitle of the book, it's a true story of turning uh, followers into leaders. And so what he does is he gets people to come to their superiors in, in the structure and say, I intend to. So the the planesman will come and say, I intend to put the bad planes down 15 degrees. And the captain will say, OK, What's our depth at the moment? How much room have we got between the boat and the, and, the, and, the, and the ocean floor? What obstacles are there? What speed are we going at? And okay, if he feels it's sensible, he'll say, okay, go ahead. What he's doing by doing that is he's encouraging people to think through, make sense of the situation, think through what decision they think should be made, and then come to him and suggest what should happen. So as a consequence, USS Santa Fe goes from being the worst performing ship in the fleet to the best performing ship produces more senior officers and more commanding officers out of their crew than any other ship in the fleet and the best line in the whole book is we had no need of a leadership development program because the way we ran the ship was the leadership development program what do most organizations do they send you off to harvard business school or some other place where you get your head filled with a load of rubbish that tells you that you know what you're doing you go and implement it in your organization your organization goes down the pan you get fired you go and get another job doing something somewhere else the whole well, I mean, is broken is this is this exactly what malcolm is saying because i malcolm i just said uh, something about subsidiary uh subsidiarity and then I asked him what it was, and uh, the summary of it is the principle that a central authority should have a subsidiary function. They should only do stuff that cannot be done at a more local local level. So that, I think, summarizes what you're saying about the ship. Is that pretty, pretty is that much? Yeah, yeah? Pretty much. okay. I mean, if, right. if, you look, if you look at, say, okay. the human body, this is what mm. the human body does. It's right. It's not that the brain 
controls every aspect of the human body. You know, the cellular communication at the cellular level, the body has, depending on whose, whose numbers you look at, it has between 70 trillion and 300 trillion okay, cells. So, so when it comes to the brain, I've got to object to you, right? Because look, I set the direction of where I'm going, right? So I don't, I don't control like the heart and the, the lungs and everything, but I kind of think, okay, I'm going to get up and I'm going to walk there. And therefore, mm. then the body follows, right? And mm. I think that's, that's kind of the original thinking of organization, right? That we better talk, kind of decide, this is where we're going to go. And then the rest of the body figures out how to get us there, right? The heart's got to pump, the legs got to work, mm. and so on. Mm -hmm. So that I really got to object to. But I guess what the, I was going to bring out what Jenkin said, right? But Which you, is, but, it was gains bias, is central to people. And then, um, you know, one sense making just basically revolve around what I can get out of it. Like every level will go, you know, what's in it for me? Well, at the end of the day, people are always motivated by self-interest, aren't they? The question is, how enlightened is their self-interest? You know, it is the self-interest of somebody in a senior level. Here is an organization that I can parasitically attach myself to, suck as much value out for me in terms of cash, kill the organization and move on to do the same thing somewhere else. Or is their mental model something of actually what I can do is create value in the world here, not just for myself in terms of my bank balance, but I can create an organization that does positive things in the world, you know, that doesn't end up like a recent large consulting firm being fined $600 million for having turbocharged opioid sales in the United States. You can Google who it is, um, but if you don't find it, it's McKinsey. Um, you know, this is what goes on in these organizations that have gone to Harvard and have thought through, how can I manipulate the world to get what I want out of it? as opposed to what is something that I can do to create an organization that genuinely creates value, including for the people who work within it. No, but I guess the, what I will say is this, right? That if we devolve sense-making, you can't possibly say that, you know, um, look, everybody in 100,000 people organizations are all going to be altruistic and, and want to contribute to the, you know, to the value that the organization is bringing up. I mean, okay, so I'm not a very pes uh, optimistic about human nature. I will say in a 100,000 organization, at least half will be what's in it for me, right? How can I parasitically squeeze as much as I can out of this organization? And then if I get fired, I get fired. I moved on to the next job. You know some horrible organizations then, Serene, because my view would be that the majority... <laughs> no, majority... no, but it's just, it's just I don't know. I don't know what's the percentage. I, mean, I guess so, so I kind of believe that 50% of humans are good and 50% are not good. Here's the thing, right? okay. you know, human beings are largely a product of their environment. You know, you put people into a situation where the only way to get on is to stomp on your colleagues and people will learn to stomp on their colleagues. You put people in a situation where they work out that in their enlightened self-interest, the best thing is to do is to work well with their colleagues and enjoy that work. And you create the conditions that make that flourish and you promote the people who are good at doing that rather than promoting the people who are good at being psychopathic and uh, looking out just for themselves. Uh, if you don't do that, what you end up with is organizations that turn out to be psychopath manufacturing machines. That's what we do. That's why if you look at the statistics, you'll find that if you if you look at the whole population, something like I forget the numbers now, but it's like two or three percent of, of people in, in the population are psychopaths, uh, sociopaths, psychopaths, whatever. Uh, if you look at it in terms of the senior executives in organizations, 10 percent are. Why? Because organizations make them like that. They select for that. They promote the ones who are like that. What the hell are we doing with our world if we're running our organizations by people who've got those tendencies? You know, no wonder people are stressed. No wonder there's no well-being at work. No wonder organizations are, you know, are such hotbeds of, 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 um, of, of illness and disease and stress. It, it, it is con it's crazy. It's absolutely crazy that we continue to do this. You know, 60 years on from understanding things like theory X and theory Y, we still produce organizations that abuse people consistently. I mean, it is just well, ridiculous. I've quoted Tiffany three times, but I'll quote her again. And I would say it's all contextual and now ones, right? I mean, it's all depending on what's happening out there. Uh, but um, let me like, highlight somebody who, who agrees with you. I mean, Eugene agrees with you. And he's saying, you know, how do you provide reliable enterprise information to people at lower levels? Otherwise, how are they going to make the decision, right? I can possibly know enough uh, to make those decisions. Mm, yeah. Well, I think if you step back and say, and it's a great question, Eugen. I mean, if you step back and say, um, what does a reliable enterprise information system look like? You know, to some degree, 
you have to say, well, what do we mean by information? And is information enough? Because if you go along the value chain of things that we tend to think of as, as being required for measurement, and I would say probably you think about them more effectively if you think about, about them as sense making, the basic level is data, then you have information, then you have knowledge, then you have understanding, then you have wisdom, right? And most organizations don't get anywhere near the end of that end of that chain. Um, so enterprise information is one thing, but information, then knowledge, and then understanding. For knowledge and understanding to be communicated between people, which is which is information uh, sense making that has a meaning to people at a human level, you have to have human contact. There is no way that you can take that out of a human being by sticking a tape measure against them and saying it's 4.7 and then saying, right, we'll communicate 4.7 to people. I mean, that's a bit like saying if you, and I used to, I used to work for the BBC in, in engineering, designing sound studios and broadcast studios. If you take Beethoven's Fifth Symphony and you put it through a spectrum analyzer, spectrum analyzer will tell you that the average frequency of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony is 1.4 kilohertz. That is true. That is information about Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. It doesn't quite have the same effect as you listening to the symphony. The same thing is true of organizations and communication and sense making, collective sense making, creation and collective co creation of new value. That happens at a human level when human beings connect with each other. So, yes, you need information systems, but the question is to what degree do people make meaning just from information? or from information in the context of the relationships in which they're embedded. That's the difference. Yeah, but I guess, um, I mean, Rose has pointed out about this, and actually I, I really agree with it, right? Which is, you look at all the senior leadership and you said, okay, you know, take yourself out of the decision, you know, you're still accountable, you're still responsible, but you're not making the decision. Mm. How likely is that going to happen? <laughs> it doesn't, well, I mean, is is a shift. I mean, you know, even if we agreed with you that it is a shift that is needed, is it actually going to happen? Well, I mean, I think the evidence over the last 30 years is that it's very difficult to make it happen because we were talking about this 30 years ago with the organizational learning movement. Um, and people thought, my God, that's difficult. Can't we do something else? And of course, firms like McKinsey will come along and dangle something shiny in front of you and say, come and do this instead. Because their business model is about mobilizing large teams of their junior people. The last thing they want is for you to mobilize your people. Because if you mobilize your people, there'll be no jobs for all of their brains on six consultants that they have to deploy in order to make money. So when you get your 100 emails, and I mean, when, when, I, when the pandemic started, right? I used to get one email a week from McKinsey within the first, and it's not just McKinsey. I mean, all the finders, minders, grinders, consulting firms are the same. In, within the first 10 weeks of the pandemic, I've got 103 emails from them. So they'd actually ramped up their production of emails to keep themselves top of mind with people like me uh, by a factor of 10 within the first 10 weeks of the, of, of the pandemic. We really need to take a step back and say, what is leadership, right? If you take John Cotter's view, which is the view that has permeated management thinking since the mid-1990s. He published the Harvard Re Business Review paper in 1995 uh, and his book, Leading Change, in 1996. And this is the thing that says, you know, create a guided coalition, create a burning platform, um, come up with your vision, you know, enroll people, uh, get the naysayers out of the way, blah, 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 that kind of thing, right? Three, four years later, my colleague, Peter Senge, no, no relation to Serene Senge, as far as I know, um, but Peter Senge, uh, he defined leadership. Leadership is the capacity of a community to shape its future. Leadership is the capacity of a community to shape its future. Now, what's always happened is that community capacity has been appropriated, hogged by people in big hats in senior positions. And as a consequence, the capacity of the organization to shape its future has been impoverished. That can no longer happen. These are these people in senior positions who are paid 300 times these days what the person on, on the ground floor, you know, the most junior employee is. You know, to, to earn that kind of money, you need to be doing something pretty spectacular. And most of them aren't. Well, I mean, uh, Sundar Rashton, I hope I'm not pronouncing your name wrongly. I mean, like, you know, protest if I am. Uh, I said, well, look, you know, is, this is, uh, what book was it? The book that you showed was published in 2015. Like, what's so new about this? It's, you know, it's all yeah. old hat, right? 
Well, but yeah, you know, I mean, what, what you, know, you, know about I mean, it? you know, I can pick up a load of books here. I mean, you know, here's <laughs> Dance of Change, right? Here's Dance of Change. That was published in 1996, right? This is this is the book in which Peter Senge defines leadership as the capacity of a community to shape its future. We don't need any more books. We've got the books. We need to bloody well take action. They do not take action. Why don't they take action? Because it suits them to avoid taking action because they're quite comfortable sitting in positions of power, holding on to the decision-making, and until the organization goes down the toilet and they go and join some other organization somewhere else, that's a lot easier than actually doing the kind of work that we're talking about here yes. on this call. Well, and he's also objecting to use, using the example of Microsoft. Am, am I? Okay, so I don't know Microsoft well enough to talk mm. about their company. I'm so sorry. I'm an Apple yeah. user. So, you know, but like, you know, is it not really true of Microsoft anymore? Is like Jeff pulling a, a fast one on us? Go, you know? go Google it. I, mean, I, look, I, 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 looked, I, looked, I looked this morning to make sure I had the most current data, right? <laughs> when, 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 when Satya Nadella took over in 2014 to, to now, seven years later, Microsoft's market value has increased 600%. It's worth $2 trillion, right? That is today's information, okay? Uh, in the last few years, I can't remember how many years, but the last few years, I remember seeing it out the corner of my eye when I looked at the stats, the last few years of Steve Ballmer's um, role as CEO, their, their stock value went down 36%. So I would say, I mean, I, you know, in a way, he's a brilliant guy because he recognized that he was not the guy to lead Microsoft into the future because he was top down command and control. Give me the decision rights. I mean, he was also the guy that laughed at the iPhone and said, ha, nobody will ever buy that. Um, and of course, we know what happened with the iPhone. And then he bought um, my, the, the, uh, the handset business from Nokia for $7.2 billion dollars which Nadella wrote off within the first six months of his job for $7.6 billion. So the best thing Steve Ballmer ever did was hire Satya Nadella as the CEO. And he, he was the person who was lobbying for him because I think he really knew that what Satya Nadella represented was the future, whereas he represented the past. And I think that's been borne out by the stock performance and also by the, by, by the product strategy. I mean, you know, I don't know about you, but when Microsoft bought LinkedIn, I thought, oh, God, I better find another social media platform because <laughs> everything Microsoft, I mean, they bought Skype. Where's Skype? I mean, you know, everything Microsoft bought under Baltimore, it went down the toilet. But under Nadella, look, you know, I mean, I wouldn't know you, Serene, if it wasn't for LinkedIn. We met on LinkedIn. That I mean, is true. You know, that is true. So, you know, there you go. Yeah, but okay. So a couple of people who agree with you. So Jenkin agreed that you know if there's an as uh, you know impact bias in the world rather than gains bias, uh, then actually that will you know what you are saying would agree that it you know it will be established. I I still stand by the fact that I think fifty percent of people. I mean, like, even distribution, you know, normal curve and all. Um, that fifty percent of people won't be this altruistic, great people. I mean. Um, I'm not I don't about, actually think it would this be. Is nothing, this is nothing to do with altruism and great people, Serene. This is to do with enlightened self-interest, right? And the thing is that when you put people in a situation where their only way to get what they want is to manipulate and scheme, it crushes their soul. And, you know, at the end of the day, they hate it, but they still have to do it because it's the only way that they can see that they can make money, put food on the table, pay their mortgage, pay their bills. You put people in a different context, where they have autonomy, where they have competence and relatedness. These three things that uh, the work of um, Ryan and DC on self-determination theory has shown are the three nutriments that humans need in order to be motivated, absolutely essential. Put them in conditions where they have those available to them and the very same people begin to flourish. So it's not about finding, you know, we suddenly need to have a magic wand. Actually, I've got one here, right? I went to the Harry <laughs> Potter wand. So here's my, here's my <laughs> Harry Potter wand, right? You know, so it's not about Potter finding wand. good people, right? Because if we so, need to so find good people for CEO, we will have a dirt <laughs> of good. Like, no, we will right. never have enough CEOs, right? People, people are very adaptable, as any parents know with children, right? People are very adaptable, and you put them in different circumstance. And, you know, the problem is, actually, because... Children are very adaptable. We actually get it out of them at school. So if you want to understand that, look at um, what was the research done by, was it Bill Jaw? I can't remember. It was a guy at NASA who showed that uh, kids, uh, how much creativity children have 
uh, at certain ages. And by the time they get to about 20, they stop doing the yes, research because the, the answer is yes. so depressing. Look at Sir Ken Robinson's best selling or you know, most viewed TED, call, uh, TED uh, video on why schools kill, kill creativity. So we drum it out to people in order to turn them into robots to work in organizations that are designed as machines. And then we wonder, and then we say we want innovation. I mean, it is just ridiculous. The whole system is screwed. So the th two things, I mean, first, so Jenna can agree with you about enlightened self-interest and that's, that's where it is. And she also agrees with you that, you know, uh, you know, people have said these like brilliant things that we need to listen to forever and ever. And we haven't, yeah. right? So yeah. my, my question is very simple, right? I mean, this is, sounds like a brilliant idea, so on and so forth. Yeah. Um, well, we haven't, right? We haven't done it. Uh, this is not just 2015. Apparently, it's like 20, 30 years ago. It mm -hmm. hasn't. And mm -hmm. why hasn't it happened? I mean, if it makes good uh, business sense, wouldn't businesses yeah. have already done it? And if it well, no, doesn't, people, well, people, don't, people, people don't do things that make good business sense. I mean, you know, Blockbuster went along to Netflix and said, you can buy us for $50 million. Now, you know, what's, what's Netflix worth today? $250 million, something like that. Um, so actually, it was five million. I think they were going. Anyway, the, the the multiple is very very large. Um, you know, um, Xerox invented all the technology that we use for um, computers. They invented the graphical user interface. They invented the Ethernet. They invented uh, what you see is what you get. Uh, text editors. Um, they didn't make any money out of it. Why? Because the people who ran um, Xerox were copier heads, toner heads, Steve Jobs called them. And so it was when he went in and saw what they were doing, he hired Alan Kay, who was the guy who invented the graphical user interface. Um, you know, that was where the Macintosh came from, and the Lisa was the precursor to that. So people don't do what's in their own best interests. And what actually happens, and I mean, this is, you know, another book that I could recommend to anybody who wants to understand the dynamics. The Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn. In there, he shows that the way scientific progress happens is not because people come up with a better theory. And, you know, Thomas Kuhn, okay, is a writer. If you really want to understand how progress happens in human society, and science is a great example of that, because we tend to think that it's, it's done on a scientific basis. So um, Max Planck, who was the founding father of quantum mechanics, quantum physics, quantum theory, which is the, the other great theory in physics um, in the last century, along with uh, Einstein's relativity theory. And he said, you know, new ideas in science do not become accepted because they explain phenomena better. What happens is that the people who are currently in the positions of power and authority in the science community eventually die, and their jobs are taken by people who are already familiar with the new theory. So. Uh, the short form of that is that science progresses one funeral at a time. And I think the same thing is true <laughs> around organizational change. 30 years on, there's now many, many more people who are saying the things that I'm saying that I was saying 30 years ago in the yeah. organizational learning community. And, and this is what happens when paradigms change. Um, I think Jenna can again mention Danella Meadows. Yeah. The biggest leverage you ever have in any system is the paradigm on which it's based. And the paradigm is changing away from organizations or machines that produce dollars for the benefit of the people who own them and screw the life and extract the life forces from the people who work there, which is why they're called human resources, by the way, because we use them as resources. We, we suck everything out of them and chuck them on the scrap heap. Well, we I mean, some of the rational was saying this is contextual. I think um, you know, Tiffany said it a bit earlier, uh, that is contextual. I mean, yes, we are very passionate about it, but it's contextual. And uh, Colin says that, well, you know, the instinct to cooperate rather than to compete has an evolutionary basis. Uh, so he thinks that people are the whole good. Hmm. Maybe. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Sorry, they, I have like a doubt, right? They, they, well, they are serene, but you do the Stanford Prison Experiment on them, and many of them will turn up the electric shock because somebody in a white coat tells them to do that, or somebody in a business suit that comes from a business consulting firm, and I've mentioned plenty of the name uh, enough times so far, but a lot of our thinking is dominated. So by you're right. It is the context, suit. right? Is, is, the, is the context, is the environment, is the... so. We are literally saying, right, that, oh, okay, you know, business thing is not, uh, is not working. We would need to change it. And how long is that going to take? Is that even ever going to happen? I don't know, but it's worth trying, isn't it? Otherwise, what's the alternative? The alternative is to continue to suck the life out of human beings, impoverish the world, create 
massive mental health problems in society, pollute the planet. I mean, we're up against planetary boundaries already. We've got no choice. We've got no choice but to change. Yeah, but the, you, you know what? Those are the biggest companies. I mean, look, Amazon is, is fairly well known in that area, right? You know, they are huge. And I think, I don't know whether they are the most, like the biggest company now, or they're fighting with Apple, but, you know, they are using people as human resources, you know, excusing every large draw of them, and they're huge. It works. I don't know. What can you say? What can you say? I mean, either you recognize the need to change or you just dig in and say, sod it, I don't want to change. Fuck the world. I don't care. Um, you know, I'll just screw them for whatever I can get out of it. And good luck to everybody else. Well, I don't know whether it's fuck the world, but I, I will say this as like okay, an ordinary citizen, uh, not, not like one of the greats of the world, it, which is this, right? So I have enough trouble getting my way around the world, you know, getting a job, making a living, putting food on the table with my family. I have enough stresses just dealing with normal life. Uh, that really, if you want to, like, you know, inspire me to a higher vision, and I'm, I'm so sorry, you know, that I don't actually have the capacity. And actually, I think, I don't think I'm unusual. I think a lot of those middle managers or even below, even senior managers, are exactly like that, right? We have no bandwidth. I'm not going out there to fuck the world, but I am not. Okay, pardon my French. <laughs> I'm not going out there to, you know, do bad things to the world actively, but yeah. I'm just wanting to put food on the table, to get the next my next numbers met, to feed my family, to just get by. The trick. Yeah. yeah. Well, and that's, know, as they that's say, the, um, the only thing that's required for evil to flourish is that good people don't do anything. And so we're in a system where you can just do what you just said, and that's fine. I mean, a lot of people will do that. But for those who are passionate and want to make a difference, get out there and make a difference, because otherwise we're doomed. Then I think this is a brilliant question, which is how do you... Can, he wants to understand, Robin wants to understand how better to make an organisation practically, like really be able to transform them into an organisational learning ethos. Mm, yeah. Well, you know, I mean, there's all sorts of systems and plans and things, but at the end of the day, it all boils down to one thing. You, the individual. You know, how much do you put effort into discovering what are your gifts and talents that you are on this planet to contribute to the human race? How much skill do you bring in bringing those out? How much do you help others bring out their equivalent strengths and their, their talents and their, and their, if you want to use the phrasing, God-given gifts? Um, and that's really the best you can do. And as you start to do that, you get better at helping others to do that. If, I mean, if that's something that, is, that you have a passion around, it's been my passion for 30 years. I, you know, I enjoy doing it. I could have made more money by being a partner in a big consulting firm, but that isn't, my, that isn't what motivates me. So I do this instead. I think it really is down to that. It's down to the choices that you personally make. Uh, and, you know, there's an old saying that is going to sound very dated these days. But virtue is its own reward. You know, the more you are doing what you genuinely, deeply, in your heart of hearts believe is the right thing for you to do, the more happy, fulfilled, and contented you are, irrespective of what kind of system you're in. And, you know, the chances you have of influencing that system in a positive way are much greater if you're bringing your light to it than just cursing the darkness. Or what a lot of people are doing, which is just, as George Bernard Shaw said, selfish little clods of ailments complaining that the world refuses to devote itself to making them happy. Well, I guess, um, I don't know how many CEOs are, are watching today, but let's say that, you know, most of us have some areas of responsibility in the organization. I mean, I, I don't own the whole organization. I'm not the top dog, but, you know, I have my own little unit or I have my own division that I run, right? So what are some practical, you know, stuff like, okay, like I really buy this, you know, I think it will be good to, to do it your way. Hmm. Tell me, what do I do next? Like, how do I move from where I am to where? Yeah. I mean, at a very human level, there are two things you can do, right? One is really think about what is it that I want to do that I feel is the right thing for me to do moment by moment. I mean, if you look back in traditional, you know, systems of morality or religions, if you like, um, in Japan, it's called Ikigai. In, uh, in the Hindu tradition, it's called your Dharma. It's basically understanding what is it that you are here on the planet to contribute and, uh, and learning how to bring that more into your actions and interactions in a consistent way. The other piece of it is helping others to do the same. You know, when, when you're engaging with people, just be curious about how do they see things. Be curious 
about how they see the world. Be curious about how they see the world in a way that's different to you. Um, you know, learn how to suspend your own perspective. Doesn't mean you give it up, but just put it to one side. See if you can adopt the other person's perspective for a moment. That that's that's key to empathy. And if you really genuinely engage with other people on the basis of being really curious about how they see the world, that is right at the core of building relationship. And it's through our relationships with other human beings who we work with or in our families or in our other groups in society that we discover how we can co-create something that really matters. And I think this is, you know, Peter Drucker spent his whole life, I mean, he did about I think it was 60 odd years studying organizations and right towards the end of his life, he was on a, uh, before the internet this was, he was on a satellite um, broadcast with David Cooper Ryder, who was the guy who developed Appreciative Inquiry. And David said to him, look, you know, Peter, if you could summarize everything that you've learned from all this career of looking at organizations, what would be the one thing that you would sort of say? And he said, oh, that's easy. He said, the secret of organizational success is to play to our strengths in such a way that our weaknesses become irrelevant. So it's, you've got to create the conditions where people discover what their strengths are, learn how to see others' strengths, and so that you can work collaboratively and cooperatively with colleagues whose strengths compensate for your weaknesses. And that is really the secret. If you could do that at a very human level, then wherever you are and wherever you're working in the organization, not only will you unlock better performance, which I guess is what organizations are often interested in, you'll be happier, you'll be more fulfilled, you'll be more contented, you know, you'll sleep better at night, you'll have a better life. I mean, who doesn't want that? Can't hear you, Serene. I don't know if something's gone wrong at my end or at yours, but yeah, I've lost I've lost your audio. I don't know if others can still hear you. Okay, so I apologize. I was as always. You were being very sorry. That's like my 2020 experience of life. But um, I was going to say that. Uh, firstly, Tiffany. Um, she loves you now, so that's great. Uh, but Jenkins says, you know, she agrees. Yeah, sure, she agrees, right? We all care about our experience in life. Um, but uh -huh, I'm going like, to bring up the disagreement, right? So Naren says she agrees, but decisions have to be data led, right? I mean, all this like, oh, this is my gift. This is my experience in life. So, you know, aren't we going to base it on big data? Like, you know, right. isn't like I even people refocus on data okay. now. Again, I come back to this, right? The reason we go on about big data is because we have big data processing capacities, right? Now, so this this iPhone 12 or 11 or whatever mm -hmm. it's to 12 in my pocket has something like 10 million times the processing power of the command module computer that landed Apollo 11 on the moon in 1969, right? We have become so impressed with our technological capability. Uh, Martin Luther King in the 1960s said, we've got guided missiles, but misguided men. Right. The problem here is that we have an abundance of data. And remember this chain, data, information, knowledge, understanding, wisdom. We have tons of data. We have maybe a bit of information. We have some knowledge. We have not much understanding. Wisdom, forget it. Right. And that <laughs> is what that is what is lacking in the world. And that wisdom comes from exactly what I was describing earlier, which is you bringing your gift collaboratively with others and living as though what Khalil Gibran, the Lebanese philosopher pointed out, which is, you know, what is work? Work is love made visible. What is, what is the love that you bring into the world? How do you make that visible in your actions and interactions with others? How do you use that as the basis for creating value? That is the thing that is massively missing in our organizations as we drill so down with our AI bots into our databases. No, but do we have the data on what makes us happy? Because Colin tells us that, you know, feelings are data too. So do we actually have the data on this work is love, you know, make us happy, you know, you know like show me the numbers. Do we have the data? Well, it depends what you mean by data, doesn't it? I mean, Colin's saying, you know, feelings are data. So feelings are data in the sense that you can use them as an input as part of your decision-making process. Um, you know, if you ignore your feelings, uh, men in particular are... Often a friend of mine's a therapist and he says 70% of men think they're feelings. So if you say to them, isn't it a beautiful day outside? They look out and they go, it's like a little Excel spreadsheet in their head. They go, uh, blue sky, tick, you know, birds, tick, green trees, tick. 
no rain, tick. nice and warm, tick. Yes, it's a beautiful day. Right? Somebody who's in touch with their feelings looks out on a beautiful day and they have a feeling that it's a beautiful day. Now, if you've spent your life distancing yourself from your feelings, so the only thing that you understand is data, then you don't, don't understand what it means to be a human being. You've already become a robot. You've already become a, an automaton. And that is such a sad thing for people to live their lives. No, no, no. It's not a sad thing. They have no feelings. They don't feel it. So just, maybe I that's agree. the reason why, right? They do. They, they feel the sadness. They feel the sadness. They deny that they feel the sadness because that's the only thing they can do to cope with it. But they don't feel the yeah. joy. And what's the point yeah, of being on the planet? It's really not going to be joyful. And you're yeah, not going to mean, be joyful. You know, you've got to be serene as well. Serene and calm. Oh, no, no, I don't know. I mean, who was it who said, let men lead lives of quiet desperation, right? That's, that's kind of what I think, right? I mean, that's why we yeah. focus on the data because... Yeah, and look and at the I'm world. And no, I don't no want to wonder, deny it. Yeah, no no wonder... Um, who was it? Um, Walden, who was the author? Um, what's his name? Anyway, yeah, massive men lead lives of quiet desperation. Um, yeah, absolutely true. And what have we done with mental health? What we've done is we've said some people lead lives of desperation that are not quiet. What we'll do is we'll devote nearly all of our understanding of the human condition and the psyche to getting the people whose desperation has become dysfunctional just back in with everybody else so that they're just like everybody else leading lives of quiet desperation. If you, if you go back to research your... Um, your actual yes, yes, but I agree with you, right? I mean, Let me go back to your actual story of what really um, Abraham Maslow said, not his hierarchy of leads, but what he actually said. His view was that anybody who is not a Gandhi, a Mother Teresa, uh, or a Martin Luther King is basically a cripple. That was his term, that that is what most human beings on the planet are living as. We're living as vastly inferior models of what we could be simply because we accept this idea it was uh, thoreau wasn't it who said the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation if that is your benchmark for human existence well guess what you're going to lead a life of quiet desperation i don't know man i guess i, I don't go expect to go around and be a mother Teresa. i'm so sorry but you know, uh, it's hard enough for me to be a serene you know uh, well, it, it turned out that mother Teresa wasn't quite as she was uh, promoted anyway and that's often the case <laughs> with, with but, okay let's people. not go there okay i'm sure there are a lot of people who still like respect her but i was gonna yeah. say right you know but, if you set the benchmark that high the then 90 the percent of us is, are gonna fail the point is so, where do you say, the point is, where do you set your bar? You know, where do you set your goal? What's your goal for existence? Is it to be the most mediocre average person that you know? Or is it to actually try and grow and be the best you you can be? And it's a personal choice. I mean, if anybody's happy just being, you know, oh, well, what hell, whatever happens to me, I don't really care. And then they end up with a miserable life. Well, it's a consequence of choices that they make. And we're often not educated about this. We're educated in maths and physics and sciences and languages. We're not educated in how to live a good life. You know, there was really the essence of teaching um, 2,000 years ago, you know, in the Greek era, the whole idea of eudaimonia. You know, it's like, how do you live the good life? Nobody talks about that these days. Everybody's like, no, you know, how do I get I enough money to buy the money? You need success. You need status. That's what I heard, you know? Yeah, At least this is what I heard growing up. There you go. There you go. Yes. Okay. So but now um, you know better. Now you know, you know better. Job, you yeah. have the opportunity to choose differently. Now you know better. You also yes. have an opportunity. Okay. So we're going to talk about the hour. Anybody else wants to object to anything else? Um. So well. Okay. So she's really appreciative. She says for a serious topic is very entertaining. So thank you. <laughs> I, I hope we brought you happiness tonight <laughs> for at least an hour. But look, if there's any other objections out there, um, Sundaresan, I'm looking to you. Tell us more. <laughs> is there if anyone else? If your objector in chief is he serene, you rely yes, on yes. him for your objections. Yes. Okay. So, um, well, I mean, is, if there is one thing you want to leave the people who are here, uh, to kind of think about and to implement in the organizations tomorrow, uh, the next month, what will be the one thing that you want to share? I would say be very, very aware that decisions don't happen in isolation. Decisions happen because of the quality of sense making that goes into the decisions. You get if you do better sense making, you have more options in the set of decisions that you might make. And as a consequence of the decisions, then you take the actions. So it's the actions that give you the results. Um, 
a lot more time needs to be spent on doing sense making. And the best sense making you'll do is collective sense making. So that would be where I would say, you know, really try and get better at sense making because the better the sense making you do, the better decisions you'll make and the more effective the actions you'll take in the world. So thank you very much. So I've just um, summarized it in two lines. Uh, decisions come from sense making, make better sense making. It doesn't sound quite as profound, but I think that's what you just said. I hope. Well, you know, if you, if you, I tell you what, it was a really good resource if you want to explore it in more depth. And I know Tiffany watched it last Saturday morning. I posted the link in a thing on LinkedIn and she said, I've just spent the whole of my Saturday morning, two hours long. There's a guy called Daniel Schmachtenberger. There's a website called Rebel Wisdom. Um, and uh, on the Rebel Wisdom website, Daniel Schmachtenberger has done quite a few things, but it's called The War on Sense Making, episode one. And in it, he talks about how what's exactly what is set up actually serene your um constructive argument session this whole idea that social media has polarized us by basically capturing the sense making and in all and and then feeding us things that cause um limbic hijacks that make us spend our time on the platform because then we can be monetized and so his whole thesis is about how before social media it was the regular media um, but it's all about who captures the sense making. Because if you capture the sense making, then you already constrain the possibilities for decision making. So it it's really goes into that in great depth. He's a very eloquent speaker, and I, I I've watched it numerous times. And each time I watch it, I learn something new. All right. So um, first, a caveat from the very Tiffany that he mentioned: it was just three to four hours. So you know, be warned. Be warned. <laughs> Secondly, um, I think Colin wants to say that no, no, it's not what will we do in the organization, it's what we do in ourselves. So do you have a different uh, advice for what we do in ourselves or is it the same advice? What are our organizations? Our organizations are human communities. So they're basically the sum product of what the humans in them do. So I absolutely applaud Colin's insight and would agree with it 100%. Okay. And, um, well, Jenkins says that, you know, collective sense making is trust, generosity, respect, and we all want that in our organization. Uh, I'm sorry that I'm still not, I haven't still been sold on the poly yet. Not, not, it, but not, everybody wants it. It. not everybody wants it. I mean, if they don't feel they can do it and they've got another way of extracting loads of cash out of the organization, then they might want to do that mm -hmm. instead. But, you know, well, maybe they're not the best people to be running organizations and perhaps shareholders and customers will increasingly realize that. Okay. All right. So, um, oh, yes. So there is even a part one and part two on the war to sense making. So it's yeah. not just well, this three to four hours, it's yeah. like four to eight hours, I think. No, the first, the first one is uh, an hour and 43 minutes, something like that, right? But the, the, if, you, if you just want to kind of get a snippet, watch the last 15 minutes. The last 15 minutes of it, is really good on the real issue that we're talking about today. The second episode is all about um, how social media has um, uh, deliberately um, tried to capture our sense-making apparatus in order to keep us as a captive audience to sell us shit. So that is, you know, what the second one is. But the first one is really about what is sense-making and how do you do it better? And like I say, that last 15 minutes of that episode will give you a clue as to what the rest yes. of it. If you watch the last 15 minutes, yes. you'll probably want to watch the first hour and a bit as well. Yeah, so the so that's the TLDR for those of you who have no time, and I think we all have no time. So, yeah. you know, that's the one. No, uh, the I war of sense-making. Serene, everybody has 168 hours in the week. The question is, what do they prioritize in how they deploy those hours? You know, uh, housework, my son, <laughs> actual going to work, making money, you know. Yeah, sorry, I'm not that on that, you know, on the same level yet, you know. So so that's what I'm prioritizing, you know, we'll, hoping the point, watching we'll the point. We'll, you stay in contact long enough, Serene, and we'll get you there. <laughs> All right. Okay. So um, for those of you who are wondering, um, we are talking about how executives must give up their decision right so we started on monday with a wonderful article from geoff we've come up with a couple from hbr and we have like come to this live discussion today and tomorrow what we're going to do or what we're going to try to do for those of you who want to do it is we're going to talk about look now that we've discussed so many of this looked at all these other viewpoints and so on what are we actually going to do with this information is there something that we can take away from it you know to 
implement in our organization, in ourselves, thank you, Colin, um, that would actually, you know, make the world a better place, kind of, hopefully. Uh, and as Geoff says, you know, save us from lives of quiet desperation. All right, so tomorrow morning I'll post out. Um, I'll try and do, okay, I don't know whether I can do a summary of what we discussed, but I'll try and do a, a post that says, look, don't worry, give us I'll, your I'll, I'll correct you if you put any words into my mouth I don't like. So. <laughs> Yes, so Geoff says senior executives should never make any decisions. That's exactly what he said. He spent 35 years saying it. <laughs> okay, so for all of you who are here with us today, um, if you want to connect with Geoff, this is his uh, LinkedIn. Uh, uh, I keep calling him Geoff. No, his name is Jeff. His name is Jeff. This is not a new person I'm talking to. <laughs> I, I've been called worse things, Serene, I can tell you. If, I, if you meet Spanish people, they usually go for Geoff. So, oh, yeah. Okay. All right, so I apologize. His name is Jeff. His name really is Jeff. Um, and if you need to connect with him, this is where you can connect with him on LinkedIn. Do come and connect with us. Uh, join our movement. We are trying to get, you know, social media to work a little bit less social media-ish, I think. <laughs> so thank you for all of you for joining me tonight. Thank you very much. And um, let's see. I see one last comment. Oh, yes. So Naresh actually likes you now. That's great. Come and join hey, us. And we'll see you. You know, tomorrow for our action piece. So, thank you very much. I'll do it, I'll and do it. tell Sundar yes. I'll, do it. I'll try and do it again in Hindi one time. But mera Hindi bahot acha nahi hai, isliye main aapke saath English mein baat karunga. Wow, I'm impressed. Okay, so uh, so, no, I'm not sure if you know uh, Hindi Sundar Russian, but if you do, let us know if he's mispronounced it. Name like Sundar. Sundar means beautiful, so Sundar Esan must be something to do with being beautiful. So yeah, I'm sure he. As at least a yes. smattering can do. Yes. Okay. So, um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, so, have a good day. Have a good evening. Have a good night. Uh, oh, he says it was excellent. Look. Oh, I'm in color me impressed. Okay. Good. So he said it was excellent. All right. Okay. And yes. So thank you, Colin. Thank you, um, Tiffany, Janakin, Warren. Um, I don't know who else was with us. Uh, the sushi. Uh, sushi. Sushi. I, I just pronounced it. You're thinking, you're thinking like, about dinner, aren't you? Mentioning sushi. <laughs> I am. I am. Okay, and Robin and everyone. So thank you so much. All right, see you guys. Bye. See you tomorrow. <laughs>